I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occurred just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. I'm Taylor Sparks. I'm here at the University of Utah in the Material Science and Engineering Department, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Andrew Falkowski. In the Materialism Podcast, we rotate between talking about materials based entrepreneurship, the history of old materials, and also new materials, processing routes, and new characterization techniques. And today we're going to learn about some incredible new engineering materials that are being made in the most unlikely of places, a kitchen microwave. Something tells me you're thinking about frozen burritos as a next generation engineering material right now. <laughs> I'm always thinking about frozen burritos is the answer. All right. Before we dive in, let's back up a little bit. Let me talk about the very first time that I saw engineering materials being synthesized and processed in a microwave. It was 2012. I was a brand new postdoc at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I was working in Ram Sashadri's lab in a place known as the Materials Research Laboratory. It's right on the beach. It's heaven. Now, that lab had some of the most amazing tools in the world for synthesizing, processing, and characterizing materials. And I remember on my first day going downstairs to the lab to get started on research, and as I looked against the wall, there was this massive fume hood. You know the ones that go from the floor all the way up to the ceiling. And to my surprise, inside this fume hood, I saw rack after rack of microwaves. And these were like kitchen microwaves, right? They're the type of things that you'd see down the aisle of a Kmart. Each machine had a little masking tape label on it with some comically ordinary name like Bruce or Carl written on it, and they were just humming quietly away with little ceramic crucibles inside. So as a student of material science and engineering, I was vaguely aware of the concept of microwave processing of materials, but I never imagined you could do it with a simple $50 kitchen microwave. Is that what is typically used? Well, you can, but it's going to have limitations. Really, there are big companies out there that manufacture really high-end microwave furnaces. For example, you know, VB Ceramic Consultants. They make microwave furnaces that can reach 1,600 degrees Celsius, that have one degree Celsius accuracy at the dwell temperature. These things are much larger. They're going to have more uniform heating. They're also more powerful, so the heating rates that you can achieve are really good. Um, but these furnaces are going to be much, much more expensive than your $50 microwave you know, machine from Kmart. And that's why some of these research groups that are just starting to explore the possibility of microwave synthesis, they'll often opt for these cheaper options. Yeah. After hearing your fascinating story of walking into a laboratory filled with microwaves, I decided to do some research into the topic. And during my research, I fell into a bit of a YouTube rabbit hole, and I found this video where someone put two grape halves connected by a bit of the skin in a microwave. When they turned it on, suddenly the spark appeared between the grapes, followed by like a fiery plasma. I was fascinated by this phenomena, so I dug a little deeper into this. And I found this research group at Trent University that burned through about 12 microwaves studying this phenomenon. And what they found is that the plasma is generated by an electromagnetic hotspot, as they call it. And that's purely just a microwave bulk effect. The grapes have the right refractive index and size so as to trap the microwaves. Uh, and by putting them close together, it, that leads to the generation of this hot spot between the grapes. Once that hot spot's created, the strong electromagnetic fields at that spot transfer energy to the ions in the grape, and thus the plasma is created. The researchers recalled that in the aftermath of these experiments, their laboratory had turned into a microwave graveyard. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I remember reading about that. And in the early days, I think people thought that you had to have that bit of skin connecting the two halves. And these people showed pretty convincingly that no, it has nothing to do with that. It has all to do with basically the size of the objects that you're putting in there and their proximity to one another. Yeah. And with that, they actually found a lot of other materials that could be used or foods. You could use uh, mulberries and blackberries. I think they also said something about using goose eggs to do the same thing. <laughs> pretty cool. All right, before you get started on how these can be used to modify materials, let's back up and explain how they work for food, since that's how most people imagine them being used. A good first question is how microwaves heat materials up in the first place. Let's imagine that you want to heat up a frozen burrito. You put that in the microwave, you set the proper time, and then you hit that start button. 
the microwave oven will heat up your food by utilizing microwaves, as the name suggests, which are a form of electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths ranging between 1 meter and 1 millimeter. If this is the first time you're hearing about electromagnetic radiation, don't let the name scare you off. All we're talking about is the same thing as the light that we can see all around us. The big difference here between microwaves and visible light is just the wavelength of the photon. The light that we can see is actually just a tiny sliver of the entire spectrum that exists. We can only see light with our eyes that is between 380 nanometers and 740 nanometers. If the wavelength is shorter, then the light has a higher energy and might be something like ultraviolet or x-rays. If the wavelength is longer, then it might be infrared light, microwaves, or radio waves. So essentially, inside your microwave, all you're really doing is just shining a special light on your food. And since this light has longer wavelengths than the light that we can see with our eyes, it actually has less energy per photon than the light, invisible light. Now, at the same time, if I were to take a flashlight of this, you know, admittedly it has higher energy light, and I shine that on my food, it's not going to heat it up. So what is it about microwaves that lets me heat the food up when a flashlight won't? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So the microwave oven generates this radiation, and then it tunes the microwaves to a specific frequency of about 2.5 gigahertz. And this translates to a wavelength of about 12 centimeters. These waves are then directed at your burrito that you put in at the beginning, causing something called dielectric heating in the water molecules. So how does dielectric heating work? So water is a polar molecule, meaning that its geometry and composition is such that it has a partial positive and a partial negative side. These poles form due to the fact that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen and pulls electrons in the molecule towards it. This causes the side of the molecule with oxygen to become partially negative, and thus, the hydrogen side becomes partially positive due to the absence of electrons. When these water molecules are hit with microwaves, the dipoles align with the electromagnetic wave, and the entire water molecule rotates. Rotating molecules push, pull, and collide with other molecules through electrical forces. This distributes the energy to adjacent molecules and atoms in the material. Temperature is related to kinetic energy of a system, so agitating the water molecules in the system raises the temperature of the material. If the microwaves have very high frequency due to really short wavelengths, then the molecules will not have time to rotate themselves since this rotation process takes a finite amount of time. On the other hand, if the frequency is too slow due to really long wavelengths, then the molecule will have plenty of time to rotate itself, but won't do so often due to how low the frequency is. Therefore, we want to choose a wavelength or a frequency which corresponds closely to the time required for molecular rotation in order to maximize heating. So early commercials for the microwave always touted the seemingly amazing fact that your food will come out warm, but the plate will not be hot. I mean, check out this ad from NASA promoting that this is the same sort of technology that astronauts use when they cook their food. Inside a microwave oven, the magnetron similarly transmits waves of energy. But since microwaves cannot penetrate metal, they are channeled inside a metal pipe, down into the oven cavity. Since the cavity is also walled by metal, there's no place for the microwaves to go but into the food, whose molecular structure absorbs and converts the energy in the form of heat. Yet the nature of food is such that only the food like this macaroni and cheese, becomes hot. The metal oven, as well as the glass or paper containers, which are all non-conductors of microwaves, remain cool. The new era in food preparation features quality frozen foods served with unprecedented speed and efficiency. By now, we hope it's clear how this works. If the plate doesn't contain any water, then there's no water to heat it up. That's right, and that's the magic behind how your frozen burrito goes from a frozen brick to a warm, soft pocket of empty carbs, processed cheese, and the cholesterol that we all know and love. Okay, so with this background, we can now move to how microwaves are used to process advanced materials. And the first question that should be rattling around your head is this. Okay, if microwaves are designed to heat water and not plates, then how are we ever supposed to use them to heat up things like ceramics that have no water in them? Well, the microwave in your kitchen might be specifically tuned to heat water, but expensive custom microwaves can also be tuned to different frequencies, maybe to uh, match different elements or molecules via the same concept of dielectric heating. So how was UCSB able to process all of their samples with conventional kitchen microwaves? They use something called a susceptor. 
A susceptor is a material which is designed intentionally to absorb radiation like microwaves and then heat up. Essentially, you use a material like graphite as a crucible and you put your material inside of this crucible where it can be heated up. Microwave processing materials goes way back to the 70s and 80s when the first microwave-assisted ceramic processing was employed. And initially, all the work was done on ceramic materials because scientists observed that when you put bulk metals into a microwave, they can't be processed due to their reflectivity at room temperature, which leads to plasma formation in the cavity. Okay, so this explains the basic problem of when you put a CD, tin foil, or a fork in the microwave. And... Exactly. If you've ever seen that happen, then you might understand that it would be a concern if you're trying to process materials in that same way. However, in 1999, there was a breakthrough when it was discovered that, you know, when you put powders, uh, powdered metal in, in that form, it can actually absorb microwave radiation and be processed. And over the next 10 years or so, microwaves were used for all sorts of things like cladding, brazing, melting, coating, and even joining innovations. Now, one of the major advantages of microwave processing has to do with the microstructure that's produced. To explain this, we should first talk about something called powder processing. Andrew, do you want to explain the basics of powder processing? Yeah, sure. So many materials can't simply be melted or poured into a shape in the same that we might, way we might cast metals or plastics. So instead, we have to start with little particles, which we pack together in some shape and then heat up until they begin to merge together. This process is called sintering and is accomplished via diffusion in order to reduce surface area. You can imagine it being a little bit like filling a cup with chocolate chips and then heating that cup up a little bit. Right where the chocolate chips touch one another, they will begin to form little bridges or contacts. As these bridges grow, the whole sample will actually shrink slightly as chocolate chips begin to fill in the empty spaces that were originally present between the chocolate chips. As the sample shrinks, it also gets stronger and more dense. There's a lot more we could say about sintering, but for this episode, we'll just note that the process, which sounds simple, can be a little bit tricky to control. And if some parts of the sample are heated up a little bit differently, they will shrink differently as well, which can lead to cracks, residual pores, or other microstructural inhomogeneities, which we want to avoid. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, so microstructure is important, and it's influenced by local temperature within the sample. Now, when materials are sintered in a conventional furnace, they're heated via heating elements, which are sort of surrounding the sample. And what this tends to do is it heats the sample up first along the surface and then eventually within the bulk of the material. This creates a gradient between the surface and the center of the object, and this can create inhomogeneous microstructures near the surface. On the other hand, when materials are heated up via microwave, most of the absorption is happening in the core of the material and less on the surface, and that can lead to extra heating in the core, which can also mean inhomogeneous microstructures due to a temperature gradient. One solution to both of these problems is to use what's called a hybrid model. In a hybrid model, you use a susceptor to absorb microwaves, and then you re-emit heat similar to a conventional oven. But you also have metals directly absorbing microwaves as well. Hybrid heating produces a much more homogeneous material where both core and surface are near the same temperature and therefore they have a more desirable microstructure. In fact, when you take these materials and you chop them open and you look at sort of a cross section, it's found that microwave heating leads to grains which are much more uniform in shape and size as opposed to the conventional heating, which can sometimes give you grains that have grown in sort of a certain direction throughout the material because of the temperature gradient present. So there's another advantage with microwave processing. Think of how long it takes for something to cook or thaw in a conventional oven. Now consider how quickly you can do the same thing in a microwave oven. This shortened timeline can have major implications when it comes to manufacturing. A series of comparative studies were carried out, and it was found that the processing times could be reduced by as much as 200 times, which of course led to massive energy savings of nearly an order of magnitude. So I feel like right about now is probably an important time for us to issue a disclaimer. Even though basic consumer microwaves have been used to process materials, it is definitely not a good idea to use your actual kitchen microwave to perform materials research. The materials you investigate could off-gas toxins or contaminate your microwave with dangerous materials. Plus, it will probably ruin your microwave if the short lifespan of the microwaves at UCSB were any indicator. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I don't recommend it for either the safety of you or for the well-being of your microwave. Okay, now that we've covered the basics of heating via microwave, how it works, and some obvious applications in sintering materials, um, we want to talk about some of the other things that have been done in the last 10 years. Let's start with microwave welding and joining. The joining of materials with limited defects is of critical importance for manufacturing industries. There's a lot of different joining techniques, but in general, the idea is to take two materials and locally melt something at the interface between them, such that when it cools, it holds the two materials together. 
Some approaches to this include conventional welding, energy welding processes using laser or electron beam, friction stir welding, soldering, brazing, etc. These techniques, however, are limited in that they involve higher processing times, higher energy requirements, costlier setups, limitations on material type, and unavoidable defects in the joints. Further difficulties include operator safety issues and environmental hazards. Research into microwave processing has revealed that it is environmentally friendly, sustainable, efficient, and a low-cost technology. Due to these characteristics, microwave processing has attracted resource researchers towards the joining of bulk materials. The potential of microwave welding was demonstrated by Srinath's research team at the Indian Institute of Technology, Rorke. Their team was able to successfully join copper metal in bulk form by sandwiching copper powder between two copper plates and then using charcoal as a susceptor material. The result was the joining of the copper plates through a weld that did not contain any micro cracks and limited pores. Srinath's team went on to produce similar results with stainless steel and mild steel, this time without any micro cracks or pores in the weld. Now, although microwave welding is still confined to research, it holds the promise to eventually see industrial applications with continued study. And looking beyond welding, microwave processing is being studied in a variety of other applications. For instance, new studies of microwave processing for melting and sintering applications has shown that microwaves can cut the time it takes to melt a particular metal almost in half, with reduced energy use as well. In composites, microwave processing is used to synthesize new nanocomposites with superior properties due to the homogenized microstructure created by microwave processing. And we're only really scratching the surface here of what they can be used for. The device that revolutionized the home kitchen is now in many ways revolutionizing materials processing. So we've given you a little bit of the history of microwave processing and helped you understand some of the key applications, but new research is happening all the time. In fact, some researchers are pairing this relatively new processing technique with a relatively new class of materials discovered in the last decade or two known as max phases. So max phases are layered hexagonal carbides or nitrides. They have the formula MAX, where M refers to an early transition metal such as titanium, vanadium, or molybdenum. A refers to an A group element such as aluminum, phosphorus, or indium, and X refers to carbon and or nitrogen. While these materials were first technically discovered in the 60s by Nowotny and co-workers, it wasn't really until the early 2000s that Michael Barsoom and other researchers realized how big this family of materials was and how exciting their properties could be. What makes max phases special is that they exhibit properties of both metals and ceramics, which gives them unique applications. Some properties of the materials include high electrical and thermal conductivity, higher than those of even titanium thermal shock resistance, low thermal expansion, and resistance to chemical attack. Additionally, these materials can all be machined using something as mundane or simple as a manual hacksaw, despite the fact that some of them are three times as stiff as titanium metal, with the same density as titanium as well. This gives these materials extremely high strength to weight ratio. At room temperature, they can be compressed to a stress of as high as 1 gigapascal and then fully recover upon the removal of the load. So what exactly would be the benefit of processing these max phases in a microwave? To answer that, we chatted with Dr. Christina Burkle, a new assistant professor at Arizona State University. Um, so my name is Christina and um, I was born in Heidelberg, Germany, so I am German. I um, did my studies in Mainz and um, then also uh, did part of my PhD at uh, Seoul National University, earning a double degree from Mainz as well as uh, Seoul National University in South Korea. After that, I transitioned and did a postdoctoral stay at University of California, Santa Barbara, working with Galen Stuckey as well as Ram Sushadri. And uh, then I moved back to Germany actually five and a half years ago, the summer of um, 2013, and started a sort of junior research group leader position at TU Darmstadt. That's a technical university south of Frankfurt and I've been completing my habilitation now that is a very German thing it's basically the next upper degree so to speak after earning your PhD so this legally gives you the right to become a full professor to be teaching to do your own research projects and so on I completed that um, and the end of 2018. And um, prior to that, I had 
already decided um, to move to Arizona State University to start an assistant professorship position. And this is what I'm doing here right now. So I'm back in the, in the States and started my position here January 1st. That's that's incredibly fascinating. Um, just to sort of move on to some of the some of the papers that we looked into, um, I was really fascinated because I, I was not familiar at all with microwave processing, and I was just wondering how how you came to utilizing this method of processing. What what was sort of your inspiration and sort of origin of how you actually found this and came to use it in research? Yeah. So short answer is my husband. <laughs> my um, origin of creativity in all uh, areas of life, if you want to say it like that. Um, so he actually started um, a project on microwave feeding because he was a postdoc also with, um, with Ram Sashadri. And um, he uh, synthesized oxides using um, the just regular microwave oven that, that was basically standing around a Panasonic instrument. Um, and, um, so yeah, so we had the regular microwave oven, just a Panasonic $150 off of Amazon standing around. And, um, my husband was using it to prepare some oxides and, um, and we just started talking like, like you do. <laughs> and, um, so I tried using that technique to synthesize some of the uh, compounds that I was interested in, um, back in the day, which were intermetallics. Um, half hoiser compounds, and it worked. It worked beautifully, actually, and um, ve very fast. So we were very happy about the results, and it was just very convenient, quick. You could prepare samples, like, I don't know, uh, within half an hour, you know, you have your sample, or maybe even less than that, depending on how high the temperatures yeah. are. Well, it's convenient, too, that, you know, I've looked up prices on the, uh, the lab-grade ones, like you mentioned, and they are far, far – well, they have greater capabilities, but they're much more expensive. So it must be nice being able to use an inexpensive tool even if it has a short lifetime. I do have a question following up on this though. You know, if you're going to use this regular type of uh, microwave oven, how do you modify it for – to be a scientific instrument? Do you have to do so in any way? Yeah. So, um, yeah, maybe I should say up front that we are not regularly using the regular microwave ovens anymore. Um, in my German – lab we still have two of them um, basically standing around but we we rarely use them um, we have um, bought uh, and that actually happened a few years ago we've bought um, a, a lab grade um, microwave oven and um, one of the biggest issues for us was to ensure reproducibility to make it more scientific as you mentioned to be taken more seriously, if you want to put it like that. Also, for reviewers, if you're trying to publish the work, reviewers are always asking these questions, the standard questions that never pop up when um, when you use the laboratory grade one. So what we've done is we have added um, an IR pyrometer to our microwave oven. Um, to be able to measure temperatures because you are not able to measure temperatures reliably in a commercial, if you want to call it a kitchen microwave oven. Um, I, I thought about it initially. The guys from the uh, machine shop, they thought I was crazy when I asked them, can we drill a hole into this microwave? I want to look inside. I want to be able to measure temperatures. They thought she's nuts. So um, I the only option that I had was spending more money, and it is considerably more money, <laughs> um, on a laboratory-grade microwave. So the one we bought a few years ago was 15K euro, and we're looking at, depending on, there's another company that, that sells them, and they have an instrument that I really like um, that you can kind of modify and run um, solid-state reactions in it. You can run um, also wet chemical experiments in it. So that's kind of, they call it a flexi-wave set up, I think, and that's considerably also more expensive. So we're looking at 30K or something. But still, like, I was going to say, to put it in context, 30K is what you spend on any high temperature box furnace, right? So you're getting a much, much more versatile tool that obviously is faster and can do things that those other ones can't, but it's basically the same price point. So it, it's exciting that this new sort of processing technique is is coming online. Yeah. 
it's it's true it's comparable or maybe cheaper than than it's but it's also adds a lot of complexity a complexity in um in your um in your experiments so maybe this is something that that people try and stay away from um furnaces are straightforward you have the uh conventional um heating setup uh, you you can run temperature programs and 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 so on. So um, with microwave heating, you never know how your precursors, your substances, um, species that you put in there will interact with the microwave radiation. With solids, it can get significantly more complex. And um, so you it it's not just oh I'm heating something up. It's much more than that. And um, yeah, if you don't know um, what you're dealing with and if you if you, uh, you don't have a lot of experience with it you first have to build up a certain amount of experience before you can actually take advantage of this technique when working with metals oxidation is always an important factor that has to be considered we next ask christina how she prevents oxidation when synthesizing things like intermetallics so of course we have to worry about it um, when we when we want to synthesize oxides obviously we can just use open containers. For phosphorus, um, you have to control sort of the reducing atmosphere around it because a lot of times we are using a susceptor material, um, graphite. So we like to use that um, surrounding our uh, precursor mixture in order to make sure that this is heated um, sufficiently. Um, so in the case of oxides, you have sort of reducing atmosphere if you're using an open container. So this is something to keep in mind. Talking about intermetallics, of course, we couldn't work in open containers because we would have ended up with metal oxides. Um, so we used we used sealed quartz um, ampules. So we used a sealed container. Um, it can be quartz. It could be um, we added some inner crucibles to also prevent a reaction between our precursors and um, and the quartz. Oh, really? How does that work? Are you talking about just pyrolyzing the inner edge, or is this something different? So Taylor just used the term pyrolyze, which refers to a process called pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is essentially the thermal decomposition of materials at elevated temperatures. During this process, the chemical composition of the material irreversibly changes, and a carbon residue is often left over. Despite the fancy name, pyrolysis can be as simple as toasting bread. Yeah, you could pyrolyze the inner edge, or I believe uh, my student um, used a boron nitride um, crucible, um, something that is inert, that is high temperature uh, resistant, and um, that does not in itself um, react very um, strongly with um, or interact very strongly with the microwave radiation. And even if it heated up a little bit, that would just you would basically stick your little ampule in in into a crucible that holds the susceptor, uh, kind of like a flower in a flower pot. That's kind of the, the closest uh, image that makes sense. So maybe as a follow-up then, if you had to say people that aren't familiar with microwave processing, what are some unanswered questions about this technique? Yeah, so I would still say it's, it's kind of a black box, um, a black box um, technique, because um, because of the complexity, how every species reacts differently, interacts differently with the microwave radiation. Um, there's not a table that you can look at that gives you the answer how the material will behave. Will it um, reflect the microwave radiation? Will it absorb the microwave? radiation and will it get hot will it um, will it do that very well or will it do it once it reaches a certain temperature will there be thermal runaway which means at a certain point you are just locally increasing the temperature very very, very rapidly um, this is something that um, you can kind of take a guess if you have some experience with it and if you have tested the material of course. So this is something that we've done is we have run a sort of calibration. So we have measured the temperature of different substances when exposed to microwave radiation. And then there's an additional variable in that you can choose different microwave levels. So the power level can be different and that influences the heating rate. It influences the final temperature. Um, so those are all 
all the things that are um, kind of, yeah, that are variable and that you need to figure out and um, are not straightforward. So this is why I think this is probably the biggest issue. So when you guys do, uh, you said that you're using a pyrometer to monitor temperature. How uniform does it actually appear? Do you see these localization and thermal runaways very often, or is it pretty homogeneous? Because that's traditionally, I, th I thought, was one of the big strong selling points of microwave processing was a more homogeneous final product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, one thing that is very critical in in the microwave processing is um, little things like where do you place your container inside the microwave oven. Um, since we're talking about a multi-mode instrument that we are using, um, which means that the microwave radiation is not um, equally distributed inside uh, the chamber. So very much like your kitchen microwave. This is why you have the turntable, right? Because you want to kind of um, even out uh, hotspots, basically. Um, so we are not, we're usually not using a turntable, but we make sure and we make a big deal out of placing our setup, our reaction setup at the exact same spot. If, if you do that, you get reproducible results. Um, but it's, it's very prone to um, change. For example, heating behavior uh, um, if you use different amounts of your susceptor. So let's say you use five grams of um, graphite as a susceptor material and you me measure the temperature, um, the, the heating profile, it will be different than if you use 10 grams, for example. Can you talk a little more about how you use processing complexity in the design of new materials? So this is what I mean with complexity. There is a lot of variables um, that you can change and play around with in order to influence your heating profile and also the outcome of your reaction, um, maybe morphologies, microstructuring of your material. It's just very complex. Yeah, sometimes people talk about all these, you know, processing variability as a negative thing. But to me, I see that as a positive. That means that there's just a really broad space that can be explored for optimization. Like it, it means it's challenging. There's a lot of things you have to keep track of. But that probably means that there's different optimization that can be achieved. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, um, complexity. Um, complexity means uh, tunability, means opportunity, um, it means you can play around. And I mean, this is what I feel very strongly about because um, we are, are um, basically in a 100% um, synthesis focused group. We also do structural analysis, electron microscopy and some properties, but our main strength is certainly synthesis. So um, we have basically a big playground with the microwave um, oven because it has so many variables that we can play with. And with such a large playground, are, are there a lot of people looking into and studying microwave technology? Um, that's a good question. So my feeling being in the solid state community and talking to people is that a lot of people like using it as sort of a quick and dirty way um, to synthesize a compound. They, a lot of them get really excited first and, and are, oh, this is great because we can make a lot of samples. It's fast. It's, it's energy saving. Um, it saves us. Yeah, it saves us time. Time, it saves energy um, and we get good results, you know, so people initially are really excited. And then once they realize how complex it really is, um, I feel like people are dropping it, the technique, um, and move on to other synthesis techniques or they, again, focus more on the classical solid state uh, techniques. Um, and there are only a few that stick with it and really try and understand what's going on. That's my feeling. I'm not sure if this is 100% correct, um, but that, that is my feeling, at least for the solid state community. Looking forward to future developments, what do you imagine are the next steps in using microwave processing for new materials research? So one thing that 
right now, again, I'm noticing is that um, even companies are not 100% set up to um, accommodate the solid state community in terms of microwave processing. You get a lot of microwave ovens um, off the shelf, basically, that you can order that you can use for wet chemical synthesis. Um, that's not true for um, for solid state synthesis. So that's something that I believe would be wonderful if um, if companies would acknowledge that there is interest and maybe even work with researchers to to um, build the appropriate uh, microwave ovens. Um, there are some out there, but um, I feel like we always have to make some adjustments. We always have to talk to the companies and be like, yeah, we want that, but can you leave out this, but add that sort of thing. One thing that we would like to um, build in or add on is um, the possibility to do in situ measurements while we run reactions. Because I'm really interested in seeing, um, looking at reaction pathways, for example, um, when we compare regular classical solid state heating in like a tube furnace or a box furnace in comparison to what's happening inside the microwave oven. And um, yeah, particularly if you're getting certain phases heating and others not heating at the same rate, like you could actually see some interesting intermediate states, I imagine. Exactly. So that's something that I would love to set up here. Um, and since X-ray diffraction, I mean, obviously that's that's great. But we have lately we have worked a lot also with um, salt gel uh, prepared uh, compounds and um, that mostly is an amorphous mixture until you reach 700 or 800 degrees C. So X-ray diffraction doesn't really get you anywhere. So we're thinking about using another technique and um, to to be able to see what is happening during the microwave processing. So you've published recently on these max phases, which are just a really interesting and really large family uh, of, of materials and compositional space that can be explored. I'm curious, from your experience having looked at this, it looks like you were looking at the transi transition metal two aluminum carbides. Um, when you when you explore this family of materials using a microwave approach versus a conventional approach, were there things that stood out to you? Was it different in a major way or was it just um, facile synthesis or speed? Like what was your takeaway by using this technique? So, um, so I thought about what material class I would like to work on. And I thought about carbides because carbides in um, – in, uh, in, in addition to the to the microwave uh, technique, carbides are, are basically the perfect choice because graphite car or carbon uh, couples very strongly to the microwave radiation. So you already have something that couples very effectively and efficiently to the microwave radiation inside your precursor mixture. So you not only have this external susceptor heating effect, you have an internal heating effect from inside of your reaction mixture as well. And that guarantees very, very high temperatures. And it is known that you need very, very high temperatures to prepare these uh, carbides that belong to the family of max phases. Um, and also, it's another story that we published um, um, a while ago is that we were able to make um, a 413 max phase. So there are different max phases, and uh, um, you you call them 211, 312, 413 max phases. Um, it, that basically shows you the stoichiometry um, of the of the max phase. And um, this vanadium based vanadium four aluminum C3 phase prior to our work, had only been prepared as a minor side phase in a vanadium carbide sample. And with that, I believe, very unique heating setup, combination of external susceptor-based heating plus our internal heating because of the graphite that is inside the reaction mixture, coupling to the microwave radiation, heating up very rapidly. Because of that, we were able to make this uh, 413 phase that 
as I said prior to our work, had only been um, observed as a side phase. Oh, super cool. Well, Christina, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Well, you've given us lots and lots of great insight on this, and I'm excited to see where the future goes and where you continue to work. Sounds like you're going to continue to do some optimization in microwave, so we'll be watching your work for sure. If you enjoyed the information we covered in today's podcast and you want to learn even more, check out the 2014 review article on microwave processing of materials by Singh Gupta Jain and Sharma in the journal Materials and Manufacturing Processes. We'll put a link in our show notes. We can also recommend checking out Christina's articles on microwave synthesis of materials, which we'll link to as well. And if you have questions or feedback, please send us emails at materialism.podcast at gmail.com. Make sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. Finally, check out our Instagram page at materialism.podcast and connect with us to let us know what new material you'd like to hear about next. As always, it's a special thanks to Colobite who created this awesome music for our podcast. He makes great stuff. Check it out at colobite.bandcamp.com. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton, the makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials. 